With CF is a life of less. Yes, less time. Less years on the clock with lung-filled pain and a constant cough, yes. With CF is a life of less. Yes. Less of a five-year, ten-year or retirement here overlooking there by such a such a year plan. With CF is a life with less. Yes. I'm Dav Matheson. My uncle Gareth Kingdom was an award-winning documentary photographer. When I was 15 years old, my uncle passed away from a disease called cystic fibrosis. I had no idea what the disease was and how unwell it made him. Five years later, I want to find out what CF is and how it's determined his life. Before my uncle was diagnosed with CF, he was often looked after by my mother. I'm going to see her and get a better idea of Gareth's early life before I was in the picture. How did me and Gareth become involved in each other's lives? Well, Gareth was 15 when you were born and he was living in Cardiff. Uh, his mum had died when, or my mum had died when he was 10 and so he was kind of part of our family because he was just like a big brother to you, I suppose. And when I was really young, how would he interact with me? Laugh. <laughs> and the pair of you just used to giggle because both of you were like, gigglers and he would just lose it and you were really funny and you were always pulling faces and just trying to make people laugh so and Gareth was like a really good audience because he'd kind of laugh at anything so um I think yeah yeah you were you were just like two peas in a pod in some senses because you were really similar and found the same things funny he was very much part and parcel of your life because if we were going out and he was around, um, he would be the one that would play with you and throw a cricket ball around and, and all those kind of th things that an older brother would do, really. And so he was less of an uncle, I suppose, and more of a, more of a sibling. He was very arty and he was, um, loved any kind of creative craft type thing so he would drag you along and although you didn't have that kind of same um, skill set that Gareth has <laughs> not being able to draw a straight line with a ruler whereas Gareth could kind of turn his hand to anything he was always really good with kids he wouldn't be really pushy and he's very similar to you in that way dad so he would be much more of a sheep dog leader so he would gather everybody around and actually involve them in, in something that they were you know, whatever he was doing, whether it be craft or whether it be cricket or whatever. He was quite a humble guy and I think that came from, in lots of ways, you know, in lots of ways he didn't have lots of opportunities because he'd had a hard time, you know, when he was born mum wasn't particularly well right up until when she died when he was 10. Um, and therefore he had to really kind of fend for himself and that made him phenomenally independent and made him kind of able to do the things in a sense and, and have a, an attitude that he just, you know, it was like, well, why can't I do it? I mean, just stupid things. Like he had a bow and arrow when he was about eight, nine, and it wasn't, it was a full size aluminium, you know, bow with arrows. And mum had set up a target down the other end of a corridor where there was a door going off. And, and Rich, your dad, walked out the one day to find Gareth with a bow and arrow pulled, that if he'd let it go, it would have killed <laughs> Rich. But actually, that meant that at the age of eight or nine or whatever he was, it, it can't have been more than nine, ten, you know, he, he was doing things that other kids wouldn't be necessarily allowed to do. So, you know. How was he growing up? With, with, and how did he engage with people when he was growing up, like through school? He had only spent half of the time in school. Now, looking back, because we didn't know that he had cystic fibrosis at the time, that, um, you know, everyone thought it was just mum not maybe not being assertive enough in order to send him to school because he would always complain of stomach aches, which actually now we know was the cystic fibrosis. And so I suppose I harshly would say, oh, just tell him to go to school, you know, kind of put your foot down. But actually it was, you know, now we know that it was actually that he really wasn't well. So, but 
we didn't, he didn't know that till he was 20, so he would still carry on and do lots of things. So, and he always was looking for the next thing that he could contribute to. And I think, you know, so at 17, he set up an exhibition for, you know, to get local artists to sell their stuff called Art for Mercy in order to raise money for Tear Fund. In my spare time, I enjoy painting. I like using oil paints the most. I like to sell my finished paintings and donate the money to people who live in developing countries. I think they should have the chance to live full and enjoyable lives, just the same as me. Although he wasn't kind of a leader from the front, actually he had loads and loads and loads of creative ideas and would very much involve people in those. And I suppose that, you know, in lots of ways that's kind of quite similar to the sorts of things that you would do, where you'd set up kind of all sorts of activities that would get people involved. So. Yeah, a heart for bringing people together, I think. After speaking to my mum, I now want to know what Gareth was like after his diagnosis. I'm meeting with Claire, who was Gareth's wife. I've come to the home they used to share to learn about Gareth's life from the person closest to him. How did you first meet Gareth? I met him in January 2006. I was helping out on a local... Um, Christian youth bus that was a converted double-decker bus called Urban Sanctuary that would go to our local estate in St Melons. When was the first moment where you thought you liked him? <laughs> well, to be honest, straight away, because he walked in and I'm thinking, oh, he's cute. And then um, we would, as a team, would always sit and have um, dinner together before we went out and did the bus. And he ended up sitting next to me. It was the only seat available, which I was quite pleased about. And he'd just come back from Africa and he was sharing all these stories about how he'd been helping with a kids' club, um, using puppets to teach the children about um, HIV and AIDS and breaking down the stigma. Um, and I remember him saying that there were three volunteers and 400 kids and he was one of the volunteers. And he was just, he was just interesting. And I remember thinking, oh, not only is he good looking, but he's interesting as well. I like this guy. And when did you first find out that he had cystic fibrosis? It was kind of known. Everyone was like, oh, you know, Gareth, he's just started helping the bus, he's got cystic fibrosis. I didn't really, well, I'm a nurse, so I know a little bit about it, but I didn't know loads. And because I liked him, um, I thought I'll go and have a look on the internet and read a bit about it. Because the only thing really, back then, you noticed was he always had a runny nose and he'd cough a little bit. But other than that, I don't think personally he was underweight a little bit. But other than that, you wouldn't have gone, oh, he's a really sick person, just by looking at him. Was this before you were dating? Yeah, yeah. So I'd looked bit of a scientific, like to know all the facts before I do anything, girl. So I, I'd read all about it, but um, it never, ever put me off. It was like, gosh, this is going to be hard. But I do remember thinking, if I walk away, because I think, mm, no, I want a safe relationship. I want to know we're going to be together when we're 80. I want to have kids. I would have been the fool, because I would have missed out on so much, because he was just such a character. I mean, you know. Mm. Um, and I still have no regrets. I'd do it all over again. When did you first talk? to him about it? We may have just been about to start dating. We were hanging out a lot. And I remember we went to his house on a Sunday and he cooked roast dinner. And um, somebody had written this book about him. Um, and there's a chapter about this guy going to visit him in Africa and about him having CF and being diagnosed a few months before and his attitude to life and things. And Gareth kind of like said, oh, have a read of this. And I think it was his way of broaching the subject because it must have been quite difficult. Mm. So I read this chapter that talked about average life expectancy of 31. And I can remember it specifically. He was pulling um, a roasting tray out of the oven. And as he pulled it out, he was saying, oh, I think it's a bit better, a bit better statistics now. And I kind of took that to mean he probably live longer than 31. And that's how it started, the talking about it. How long do you, were you expecting to be with him? I was thinking at least 40. And how old was it? He was 30. He was 30 when he died. They didn't realise how sick he was or how sick he'd been. And as like, you end up talking about things and I'd share what life sometimes is like, they'd be really shocked and hadn't realised. Like even his university friends he was close with didn't realise what he had to do every day just to keep well. I didn't have a clue. Cause I, I obviously I knew him for 15 years, but I didn't have a clue about... He would have been happy about that. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it makes me think because whenever we hung out together, it was always very, very silly very happy well we used to laugh all the time and i don't know whether actually there are some blessings to having really hard stuff in your life like cf and the big hard life things you have to deal with 
because it just gives you a sense of perspective about everything else and so many things you just we just let wash over our skin and didn't bother us and we made the most of every opportunity and where you could laugh we laughed and even if it was a hard thing to do with him being sick or infertility we'd find some way of making a joke out of it or laughing mm. and being fun having fun i didn't talk to gareth much about this how much did his faith impact the way he looked at his life and the way he lived his life um and it was an active faith and he had a real passion for the underdog I suppose and when I met him and was dating one of his favorite quotes that was stuck to his computer was one from the Bible about um, God loving widows and orphans and I think his own experience of losing his mom when he was young really impacted his experience of God and knowing God loved loved orphans and widows and actually cares for them and, and instructs people to care for them really helped influence where he wanted to make his difference in the world. And what's the best thing about Gareth? Um, I can I'll give you an example and tell the story of how we got engaged. Um, you know, I always did things, not, not by halves. So um, got engaged and he planned a weekend in Paris. Didn't tell me about it, organised it behind my back with my best friends. Um, and basically flew me to Paris and he'd ordered a table at the oldest restaurant in Paris where like Voltaire and all the philosophers used to go and we had a meal there and that was good enough in itself but then we went to the Chateau de Versailles um, and we looked around there and he took me on a rowing boat in the middle of the Chateau de Versailles in Paris and got down on one knee on a rowing boat and proposed. It was all very lovely. As much as Gareth didn't want to be identified as someone with cystic fibrosis, it played a huge part in his life. To find out more about the implications of CF, I've arranged to meet with Dr Ian Ketchell, Director of the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Centre in Wales and Gareth's consultant. So Dr Ketchell, could you let myself know, because I don't know much at all, what is cystic fibrosis? Well it's the most common genetic inherited condition in the UK. So there's one in 25 chance that you actually carry the gene. But carrying the gene on its own means nothing. If you get one from mum and get one from dad and you've got two genes, then you get cystic fibrosis. And it's quite simple really. All it is, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the lining of the airways that is pumping out um, something called chloride. And there's a little sodium channel next to it that sucks in sodium normal. And with cystic fibrosis, that channel that's pumping out the chloride is missing and the sodium gets overactive. So you've got sodium, you've got chloride gets stuck in cells, that's salt, and that just drags in water. So airways, anything that produces mucus, so the airways, your pancreas that produces all your digestive enzymes, your gut, they all produce things and they become dehydrated and that's actually the main factor. And the main problem is in your lungs. So when you've got all this thick mucus, the hairs break down, you can't clear it, it gets infected, it causes the airways to become wider and thicker and damaged and that's bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis is just a genetic cause of that and then that of course to leads to lung destruction and the main cause in, of death in cystic fibrosis sadly is due to respiratory failure. How common is the disease cystic fibrosis? Oh, there's over 10,000 patients in the UK. Like I said there's a 1 in 25 chance you carry it, carry the gene, but there's a 1 in 2,500, every 2,500 child that's born in the UK will have cystic fibrosis. How does cystic fibrosis affect someone's daily life? Oh, it's, uh, it, it's a complete change in everybody's daily life. For those patients with, there's obviously a whole spectrum. We've got some patients with milder disease to end-stage disease. It depends where you are on that spectrum. But daily, daily job, if you've sort of got moderate to severe cystic fibrosis, you have to clear that mucus. You not only have to clear it, you have to take all the treatments, the antibiotics, to stop you getting the infections that cause more damage and more destruction. So the average patient will get up and they will do special physiotherapy airway techniques to clear the mucus. They may take a nebulised um, uh, hypertonic saline or something called DNAs that breaks down mucus or even capsules and other dry powder inhalers. They'll take a whole barrage of these things to try and clear the mucus and then they'll actually take inhaled antibiotics through nebulizers to try and keep all the infection down. Then on top, that's just your lungs. So is the nebulizer like 
A machine. A, a machine. So you'll see with asthmatics, when asthmatics are very poorly, they'll have these face masks on that are giving them things to help their airways open up. In cystic fibrosis, that's a daily routine. Sometimes to open the airways up as well, but more to put in medication to inhale it to help break down that mucus to clear it then they have to do all the physiotherapy to remove that then they have to blow into various gadgets that will help clear the sputum we have many of those different versions and we tailor the physiotherapy to every patient but then the nebulized antibiotics and some of them are dry powders and a bit more simple to give are there to sort of line the inside of the lungs to try and keep infections that are chronically there at a minimum because it's those that will cause the infections and more damage. So, um, to find out if I'm like a, an actual carrier, you could have a blood test. It's a simple blood test, yeah. But we're, we're always really apprehensive about this because it's how will you cope then about knowing that you're a carrier and about your family and your children. So a lot of patients we actually refer on to. You can have that test done by your GP, but you can have that. We sort of say if there's a really strong history is to have family testing through a genetic um, counselling service because what they'll do, they will say, right, well, you've got this particular gene that your risks, if you meet somebody else with this other gene, will be this amount. But you, they may find a rarer gene in you and then if, if you get the common one, is the child of yours how badly affected? Because there's some that are very mild that will just mean that men are born infertile but no, nothing else. So there's a lot more to think about, and that's why genetic counsellors are brilliant. Okay. So we refer a lot of our patients over there. In your case, I think you've had it done. When I was a child, I was tested for the most common genes associated with cystic fibrosis and given the all clear. However, there is a possibility that I could have the genetics that can pass it on to my own children. I'm now having a blood test which will determine if I'm a carrier of the gene or not. With no experience of meeting people with CF other than Gareth, I want to talk to a young person who is both my age and the age Gareth would have been when he was diagnosed. I'm on my way to meet Felicity, a 20 year old with cystic fibrosis. How do you find it when you see other people with CF and you know you're not allowed to approach them? Um, I think it hasn't happened that often. So for the a good majority of my life I didn't realise that other people had it. I thought it was just me and my sister because I hadn't seen any. Um, I think I saw the first poster for the CF Trust when I was like a teenager, so I had no idea that other people had it. And what's been the biggest difference, do you find, with yourself to people who don't have CF? I mean, probably the biggest thing is having medicine when I eat, so every time I eat I have to have Creon. And I think, yeah... I wasn't too old, but I was still maybe like late primary school when I realised like no one else has to have medicine when they eat. Um, and I kind of thought, oh, what would it be like if you could literally just grab anything and not have to, <laughs> not have to worry about that? And how do you find having to take all this medication before eating and drinking? At, at this point, I'm more used to it. And because I know the reason... Like, the, the, yeah, the consequences of if I wasn't to, it's okay. But in the kind of, like, adolescence, I was a bit more resentful of it, of having to do it, and I was always, like, kind of, like, why do, <laughs> why do I have to do it? And do you ever get conscious about doing it in front of people? Or... I don't think I've ever been conscious about it. So I've, with, like, coughing or burping as another side of it, well, mm -hmm. a symptom, mm -hmm. um, or, like, taking medicine. And I've never, like, been conscious... I think the only reason I'd hide taking medicine is so that people don't ask mm. because I don't like making a, a big deal out of it. After talking to Dr Ketchel and Felicity, I have learned that with CF it is a spectrum and Gareth was on the harsh side of it. With such an isolating disease, I want to learn what Gareth was like when working because for me, if I had CF, that would be the main priority. After winning awards for his documentary photography in Africa, Gareth's work was beginning to get noticed. By exhibiting his work on the townships of Kenya, he was headhunted by Tay Sheraton to photograph a project she was working on in Liberia, Africa. So I was working with this charity and we had a project in Liberia where we were training nurse anaesthetists, of which they were very short. Um, and as 
we, so we're doing trips three times a year to support their training because after the Civil War they, they had very few nurse anaesthetists for the population. So at the time we started the project, 24 nurse anaesthetists for a population the size of Wales. So it's, you know, I think it's nearly 4 million actually now, but maybe 3.8 million at, at the time. Um, and so they had a massive capacity issue. They couldn't produce enough nurse anaesthetists. Um, and that's something that's important for women in labour to be able to go for safe caesarean section because they die of bleeding, sepsis and eclampsia, the three biggest killers. So we've been doing this project a while and then and it was very much around empowering the, the people on the ground in Liberia to uh, develop the service themselves um, to support them in the training that they were already giving. And I went to I went for a cup of tea at Waterloo Tea Rooms with a friend of mine, and some of Gareth's um, work was on the wall, and I was really really impressed and inspired by it. And you could see that there were some words with it as well. I think um, which uh, where he spoke about the importance of um, empowering the people, being part of it being a partnership and being very much embedded in, in what was going on there. And they were just stunning photographs. Um, and so I thought it would tie in very nicely with what the charity um, stood for and um, what he seemed to stand for. And so I contacted him and I think we met either at Waterloo Tea Rooms or we might have met here for the first time and he was very very enthusiastic I told him about the project and I told him how it worked and he very much wanted to come and and do do some photographs to document um, particularly the progress of, of the project as, as it went along so um, we spoke he's very keen and then we kept in contact uh, I met his wife Claire and Claire was also somebody that we thought could be very useful for the project because she's a, a chronic pa a pain she was an acute pain nurse sorry at the time um, and that could have tied in very nicely as well um, and then um, we finally got um, so we're going three times a year and then we got a grant uh, from the Department for International Development um, and at the start of that project, I thought it would just be perfect for Gareth to come out and start documenting um, what was happening at the beginning of the project and then um, to progress that as it, as, it, as it went through. So we spoke again and we arranged for him to come. And uh, yeah, that, that's what happened basically. What was his personality like when you first met him and told him about coming to Liberia? So I could see he's ver he was very, very driven, very driven and uh, very um, firm in what he believed in. Uh, yeah, and you, you, when he was ill, you saw that as well. So he was really, he was really quite stroppy at times. I'll be yeah. honest, with the nursing, not with me, but with the nursing staff, he could be quite stroppy. So yeah, I, I've learned he could be quite stroppy and stubborn. <laughs> yeah, no, he was very stubborn and very driven, and um, you could see that that had got him a long way. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. It me, really means a lot um, to you all to be here and. Uh, um, yeah, so it's the first time I've exhibited in some Wales. Um, so it's nice to see everyone that I know and uh, uh, care about sort of be able to see all the things I've been up to in the last couple of years. Um, but I uh, yeah, just wanted to do a sort of quick sort of talk um, about uh, why the project um, and sort of how it sort of evolved. Um, but for me, the project sort of started um, about 2004. Um, I worked in a uh, township called uh, Tembe in South Africa for about uh, just under a year. This place is Waterloo Tea Gardens where Gareth actually had an exhibition here where all the walls were covered in his own work and all the work was dedicated to his uh, time taking photos in townships. And one of the major places where he went was Africa, and Gareth had a real connection with Africa. That's where we're going to go. It makes complete sense because he had a connection out there. 
Um, from talking to Claire, that's the place where his heart was. His heart was in Africa. I know Gareth loved Africa, but what was it about these places that made it so special he would be willing to risk his own life to take some photos? I want to see this for myself. I'm going to pack up and fly to one of his favourite places and see a slum with my very own eyes. I'm going to Mbale, Uganda. in Namatala it's actually very humble and very nice because you walk out everyone wants to greet you especially the kids the kids come and run up you saying Mzungu 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 How are you Mzungu? And that is it's a bit daunting at the start but you realise that's their way of life and that's how they interact but the brilliant thing is that they love to interact every person you pass they'll greet you and say hello. Claire told me about Gareth's best friend, Sam. I met Sam once when he visited the UK to see Gareth. Before I arrived in Uganda, Claire told me he had recently been unwell, so I didn't know if he was still alive, and if he was, I wouldn't know where to find him. After being in Uganda for just under 24 hours, I'm told that Sam is still alive and lives in Namatala. I'm going to find Sam and see what he has to say about the time he spent with Gareth. Hi, Sam. <laughs> You're older, yeah, 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 but you look younger. Yeah. You should be enjoying cash in London. <laughs> so Sam is a local pastor, um, and he's been doing it for many, many years. Um, he looked after Gareth while he was here, even to the point where he came back to the UK to see Gareth, and I actually met him around about eight years ago. So it's been a long time we actually get to meet up. Uh, he probably doesn't remember what I look like or who I am, but once we get talking, I'm sure he'll remember, and I've got a picture of Gareth to show him. And it'd be really cool to interview him. So we're looking forward, to, I'm looking forward to it, because he'll probably have a lot to say about Gareth. He wanted to find out how people live in a hard environment, and maybe how best he can improve by his ideas. <laughs> and uh, because he's, I think he's, Video coverage was not beyond just video coverage, but just to find a story behind mm -hmm. how people live and how best they can live in their area. Um, and uh, that was exhibited through his um, ideas, um, or even having an eye that sees opportunity in a difficult situation. So, like if somebody is doing tailoring. And he was seeing that as a positive. And probably he would go ahead and want to know how best those people can add the value mm. on what they are doing. Yeah, I knew I was living with somebody who is a miracle. <laughs> uh, living by miracle, living a day as it comes. Mm. Um, and so... How did you find out who told you that Gareth died? And how did you find out? Um... I, I saw it on media. Uh, honestly, Claire didn't uh, speak it right away. I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, so I just got it. I, on his 
Facebook or something like that. So I realized mm. the guy is dead. And so uh, I felt so I felt like after knowing about it, I felt like maybe I should run right away to you, you Wales. <laughs> but of course, that is uh, an imagination that can never be reached upon. Claire came came with more of the pictures, but I had the pictures already, so mm. I get them out and go around and tell those people I knew were friends that this friend of ours has uh, mm. passed on. Sometimes it's hard to when we um, picture and uh, and look at how valuable somebody is to you. These memories come, yeah, sad moments. He <laughs> uh, was my brother, this young man. He was he was he was younger to me, but he was uh, had things that that would take you to another level. Yeah, the ideas he had, uh, the love. For, the, for, uh, for people, and not just based on words, but uh, he was, um, yeah, made things possible. Uh, idea, his ideas could cause you uh, move on, mm. even when you're having challenges here and there. He's very good. Frank is a local of Namatala. He has agreed to show me around. With an estimated population of over 30,000, Namatala faces extreme poverty, and with that comes issues such as alcohol abuse, drug abuse, prostitution, and child abuse. Most of the community try and make a living by selling goods on the street. Yeah, this is kind of like the business hub of Namatala. Um, it smells quite like a smoky smell. Um, it's not actually like people make out as if it's going to smell really bad. It doesn't smell, and people, when we see it back home, it's all about the waste the little people have and how sad and how bad it is. Behind me you can see that there's a butcher's, that's somebody's business. Somebody's obviously very proud of this. We've learned that Uganda's extremely proud and extremely happy people in the situation that they have. And if you think about Gareth, that's what he aimed to show. He aimed to show that no matter what your situation was, you can still be positive about it and have something to be extremely proud of. Near us is a uh, pharmaceuticals which they call the drug shop. It's too expensive to get tested for any illness or sickness. So what they do is they presume what they have, um, something like malaria. If you think you've got malaria, they'll just go into the drug shop and buy medication for it. If Gareth tried to buy his medication from there, he wouldn't have lasted a few days. From what I heard, he bartered with somebody nearby who owned a fridge so he could keep his medication now. A water pipe's burst. So these guys are all working together to uh, fix it. Being shown around Namatala was extremely real and eye-opening, but nothing could have prepared us for what was about to happen in front of us. Okay, so we just had to change the camera around to here because um, uh, a child, a child has just just died. So that's that's what the screen is. Um, I don't know what what's happened or, or why. But I'm not really sure what we do, but everyone's kind of going over there, um, and I think we're going to have to move now just to be on the safe side. We had to finish the filming. Um, we were told by Frank to stop filming um, and to leave Namatala. Cause sadly not, not across the community, but round the corner, a one and a half year old child died. And we could hear the wailing of people. So we had to stop out of respect cause Ugandans are very proud people. Um, they pride themselves on their positivity and the communication of someone passing in the slums takes 10 to 15 minutes for it to reach the whole area. So as we found out within 
within seconds. So we were then told that we needed to leave, stop filming and get out. Gareth's way of getting involved with the local community would have been through creativity and photography. My skills don't lie in photography. It would be right for me to get involved with what I know, football. We're actually in Namatala Primary School. We're higher than Ben Nevis right now. And this is Namatala's football team. Coincidentally, they're called Sky Sports Football Club. Their manager, called Guard, who they call Pep Guardiola. I've just talked to, and he has just amazing stories about this place, and I can see why people have so much love for it. I know, I can see why Gareth had such love through photography, because so much change and so much good is happening through here. He got to invest what he loves into a slum area. This is what I love. Sadly, I can't actually hack it because of the, the altitude we're at the unfitness of myself. <laughs> so it's pretty embarrassing that I can't actually join in after a few sessions. These guys are incredible. From talking to guards, these guys come from a slum which has the reputation many years ago for alcoholism, drug abuse, poverty, thieving, everything that's bad when it comes to poverty. This place had it. Since then, God just says this place has changed so quickly. And the reason why he has so much love for it, these guys all come from Namatana. These are all from slum. And you can see by them, they're always moving. They're the fittest bunch of guys I've ever seen in my life. And some of the best footballers I've actually ever seen. So they've come from the lowest of the low. And I can just see why Gareth loved it, because the people out here who coach, who train, who counsel, they don't do it for their own financial gain. They do it because they love the people, and that's what Gareth loves here. It was the people. Sam, thank you okay. so much. Okay. It's fun having a... All right. Uh, I really appreciate you. Ah, uh, all right. I'm, I'm so glad we could find you, mm -hmm. and you've spent so much time with us. Yes. That we got to learn so much about you. Yes. So much about Gareth. Yeah. And so much about the community in which you both lived in. Amen. And it's amazing to see and Amen. I can see how much you and other people love this place so much Amen. and why people invest in this place because there's something so special about it and throughout this time I've learned so much. So well, I really appreciate you. It's also good to, uh, to have to having had a relationship that could later uh, still have other people make a follow-up mm. uh, with Gareth's life. Uh, that means uh, Gareth lived a, a life that was meaningful to the Lord. If we can still have traces, uh, his, li his life traces, even up to Africa, he shows how significant this person was to us. So I'm also very happy that you chose to come here because he has gone to different places. You'd have gone to South Africa, you'd have gone to Kenya, but you chose to come to Uganda. So this is very great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, your regards to every person in the UK, or rather, yeah, UK, uh, particularly uh, his wife, that is um, Kelea. Yeah, please. Of course. Send my regards to Kelea so, so, so much. She will love to hear. Tell her uh, she's welcome. <laughs> she, she will be so ecstatic that me and yes. you got to meet. Yes. And that would be amazing. Yeah. But you're still welcome, even after any time, you can come back after your school. <laughs> you're welcome always. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Okay. My time in Mbale is coming to an end. Being welcomed into the township has been incredible. I came to a city on the other side of the world with just a picture and a name. I can see why Gareth thought Africa was so special and why he wanted to show the positives of slum life.
I am now back home to talk with my mum and discuss the results of my blood test. And it says, hi Dav, although I don't normally like to discuss this over email, but yes, you are a carrier of CF and you are a carrier of the CF gene, which on its own will have no effect on you, but we have sent you an appointment to discuss the results and chat about your future gene- generic, uh, genetic counselling. Okay. So to that, the answer is yes, I am a CF carrier. And I'm actually not surprised because you are so like Gareth in so many ways that, and that kind of gene, I suppose gene pool comes from my side of the family. And so therefore I would rather you hadn't, you weren't, but how do you feel about it? I don't know. Uh, it's hard because I, I've known for a little while because Sadly, I saw that email a few days ago, right? And it didn't give much subtlety, right? Uh, so it, uh, it, it it's hard because I'm the first person in the family to actually no do the test and, yeah. and be tested positive, mm. which is something new in the family. This is a document from. Tay, who was the last person to see Gareth when he worked in Liberia. And it's like a scrapbook of the work he did in Liberia, although it wasn't very long. But at the back, what it does actually have is Gareth's last moments. Gareth was admitted directly to Landoc on the Wednesday evening around 7pm. He suffered a respiratory arrest on the Friday evening. He initially made a good recovery from that, but remained critical. He was put on a ventilator on the Sunday. He remained on the ventilator until his death in the early hours of Thursday, the 21st of March, having been ventilated for 10 days. He died in the presence of his sister Ruth and wife Claire. We will miss him dearly and our thoughts were with his family and other friends. After all the people I've met and all the places I've seen, I'm going to see Claire one last time and she is taking me to where Gareth is buried. I was too unwell to attend Gareth's funeral, so this will be the first time I get to see the place Gareth is now. Sitting there in the guest house, and obviously we still don't know what happened to, to Sam. I'd say we're about here. Really? Yeah. Oh. How does it feel? It's just weird because it's five, five years. Very long time. Five years. He would have been my age when he was How diagnosed. How old are you now? 20. Mm. So he'd be my age when he was diagnosed. And, and yet he still lived an incredible life and impacted so many people. Now, I can't tell you the amount of amazing stories I've, I've come across now because of him. For someone who was shy, who didn't like being the centre of attention. Yeah. He was very humble. Yeah, so, so humble. He just kind of did what he could, when he could, without making a fuss, somebody once said about him. I think that sums him up. Yeah, perfectly. He was always one for, he was a can-do, he had, he had a can-do attitude. And if he wanted to do something, he would think about how to do it and not the reasons he shouldn't do it. So he always thought big. Um, and people are always like, Gareth, you can't do that. And he'd be, he wouldn't say anything, but he'd just be like, watch me. And he'd go off and do it. So I have thought big. I've gone on big holidays. I went whitewater rafting down um, the Nile in Uganda when I went on my own trip to Africa on my own to go visit the places he took photos of. I decided to organise an art exhibition of his work, um, but rather than base it in one Waterloo Tea Garden um, venue, I decided to base it in three and it turned into a big um, big event um, for the whole CF community and I can remember his best friend saying Claire that's going to be a lot of work you know and I thought yeah but he would do it and it, it was a lot of work and I'm not sure I'd do it again but I did it and when people were like you're crazy it's mad I thought that, that's a compliment because that's what they used to say to Gareth. I've, I've been told I'm crazy and mad <laughs> many a times. I've truly been blessed to walk in Gareth's shoes. Your life cannot be defined by diagnosis, 
the only person that can diagnose an individual's true limitations is the one in control of the body. A small, shy man with the odds against him prove that legacy is the greatest thing you can leave. A satisfactory life is not how long you invest in your own life, but how much you invest in others so your legacy is so great your body is not of concern. Even though you're not on a platform, you can still play a significant part in this world. A life of less, yet so much more. More hospital sleepovers, yeah, but so. More coughing fits, more obstacles to face, yeah, but so. There was so much more. Less than half a lifetime, yes, but more creative fun than you can fit into three full ones. More adventures that will blow your artistic socks off. More laughter that will make a bit of we come out. More pictures framed. More paintbrushes dipped and brushed. More memories made. More creativity crafted. More breathtaking views. More of life captured through a hope-filled filter. More faith in the big man upstairs. More trust in a better life on the other side. More taking every moment of life in. More being present. More sense of optimism. More glasses half full. No. More glasses so full it's filled to the brim and tipping down the sides. A life with CF is a life with less. But a life in Gareth was a life with so much The team behind A Life With Less would like to personally thank a few people for your contribution. Without your guys' help, this would not have been possible. The Thai community of Lady Strat, thank you ever so much for what you've done. Uh, the Leck With Coffee Morning Group, thank you ever so much. Nida Hicks, thank you so much for, for what you've given us. Steve Williams, thank you so much for your support and contribution throughout this whole thing. Uh, Bob and Yvonne Stimson, Thank you ever so much for everything you've done throughout the past eight months. And Keith and Barbara Matson, thank you so much for everything you've done. Without this, guys, this would not be possible and the programme would not be made, so thank you ever so much. <laughs>